I'm Chad. And this is my 2012 Triumph Daytona 675R race bike. Now, over the past few months, I've had a few questions about this bike, how I like it on the track, what modifications I've made to it, what I've had to do to get it ready to go race. And I figured today would be a great time to make that video. I just finished prepping the bike last night for the upcoming CDMA race weekend. That's this coming weekend in which I will be participating. For those of you that are unaware, CBMA is the Chuck Walla Valley Motorcycle Association. They have a club racing series that takes place exclusively at Chuck Walla Valley Raceway up in Desert Center, California. So I'm going to be heading out there and going to get some racing in. Really excited to do that and excited to go back to Chuck Walla. Chuck Walla up until this year was actually the only racetrack I had ever been to before. I just started going to Button Willow in February and then of course joined the California Road Race Association. So I've been racing with them throughout this year so far. But their season has ended for 2021 and I still wanna go race. So I was granted reciprocity with my CRA license. So fortunately for me, I didn't have to pay the full CDMA membership fee for the entire season. I get three free rounds on reciprocity just in terms of the membership fee. Still have to pay my fees to go race. And we'll have those videos coming out next week after the weekend is done. But anyways, the bike's all prepped and ready to go. I'm gonna go through some of the modifications that I've made, talk about the bike setup, and just show you some cool things that I've done to the bike, just in terms of making it more user-friendly, show you what I've done to set it up to race, and hopefully give you some direction as to what you might wanna do with your Daytona 675R. So the first and probably most obvious modification of this motorcycle is the race bodywork that I have. As you notice, there are no headlights here. These aren't taped up. This is fiberglass race bodywork. There's no tail light in the back. This is required to go race because if you do crash and fall, your lights are probably going to break depending on how the bike hits the ground. And it can cause a mess on the racetrack. It's more expensive to crash OEM bodywork. So this stuff's good to go. Now, one of the other things that's really nice about this bodywork is it's designed to be removed easily and reinstalled. So it's really only two pieces on the front. We have the whole upper fairing up here, and then we have a belly pan down below that is enclosed, so it will catch any fluids or anything that might leak off of the motorcycle, thus preventing any hazards on track should your motorcycle do such things. But I do my best to maintain mine and always check it before every race weekend or track day to make sure that there are no leaks and make sure that I'm not posing any additional danger or risk to anyone else out on track, as well as to myself. So it also has a race tail section, as you can see, with a foam pad for a seat. Now, I've seen a couple other race bodywork kits that just have a fiberglass tail fairing that deletes the tail light, but reuse the OEM seat. And I'm not a huge fan of the OEM seat, especially on my bike, because again, this is a 2012, it's a nine year old motorcycle. So that seat's gotten a little bit slippery over the years, but I love the foam pad. Mine's 10 millimeters thick. The foam pad is very grippy. You don't slip around in the seat much. And it's still padded enough where your butt won't get too sore, but you also get a lot of feedback back through the motorcycle and the chassis and the subframe. So I really like the feeling that you get. You just feel a lot more stable and in connection with the motorcycle. So other obvious modifications that I've made, you will notice my front tire has no tread. The rear one does not as well. These are slick tires. These are the Dunlop NTEC slicks. So Currently on the bike, I have a soft compound front and rear. The front size is a 120-70-17 standard, and then the rear is a 180-60-17. These are fantastic tires. The softs I've only run for actually two races and one practice session, so these have plenty of life left in them. The tires feel incredible. If you've ridden street tires, even high performance sticky tires before on track, going to slicks is a complete game changer. You get way more feel through the bike and just through the tire and the grip is unbelievable. Even compared to like a Q4 or a Pirelli Super Corsa. Slicks just on a whole nother level. Now I have tire warmers to heat these up because as you may be aware, slick tires have to be at a certain high operating temperature before they will generate traction. You go out on cold slick tires and you try to ride even like 50%, probably gonna have a hard time, might end up on the floor. So I have chicken hot tire warmers. They're the basic ones, don't have multi-temperature settings or anything like that, but they work great. So that's what I use. So in addition to the race bodywork, we also have some racing derived bike protection in the form of GB Racing case covers. So this is a clutch cover and this is a timing cover cover. They're hard ABS plastic and they're designed to prevent the cases from being punctured if the bike does go down. 
That's great because it will prevent oil from leaking out onto the racetrack, which is a pain to clean up and can, again, pose a risk to other riders. So these are required to club race, as is the race bodywork. In addition to these, I've also added RNG carbon fiber tank sliders to my tank. Now, some club racing organizations will require these, particularly on bikes that have tanks that protrude past the frame, like the Daytona 675 here. The R6 is another common one, but in the event that the bike falls over, these will prevent the tank from being punctured, We can fuel onto the track, which could result in a fire, which would be a bad time for everybody. So these were a hundred bucks on Revzilla. The case cover set, I believe was 210 also on Revzilla. So great parts there, give you a little bit of adding confidence if the bike does fall down, that it's gonna be okay overall. So the last little piece of bike protection that might not necessarily be protection, but is required per most club racing organizations and all pro racing organizations is a brake lever guard. Now this is just here so that if you're bumping elbows with another racer, they can't accidentally engage your brake lever. Obviously, if that were to happen, could result in a crash or some other sketchy situation. So absolutely essential piece of equipment. Even if you're just doing regular track days on your motorcycle, still highly recommend one of these. Could absolutely save you from going down if someone gets a little bit too close to you. So the next modification down here are my attack performance rear sets. These are fantastic, fully adjustable rear sets, height adjustable, forward and backward angle, and they have extremely grippy foot pegs. Your feet will not slide around in these. They do tear up boots, and I have actually seen a lot of people file the edges down just a little bit to make them not as sharp, but these hook your feet to the motorcycle. It is incredible. Now I have the carbon fiber heel guards. They do also make a metal set and it's just optional, whichever one you want when you order the rear sets. But I went for the carbon fiber to go with the rest of the look of my bike. Being a Daytona 675R, it does have some carbon fiber part stock. We've got the rear fender back here, the exhaust shroud, as well as the front fender. But the attack rear sets are a fantastic piece. They have really enabled me to get comfortable on the bike and get my feet in a position and really enabled me to put my body in a position where I feel very comfortable and in control of the motorcycle. So highly recommend aftermarket rear sets and I absolutely love the attacks. They feel super solid and just really well put together. One of the other nice things about the attack rear sets is that they are capable of GP shift or reverse shift. So they flip your shift pattern. So rather than down for first gear, up for everything else, it's up for first gear, down for everything else. But this is helpful on the racetrack because when you're leaned over in a corner, if you need to shift up a gear, you don't have to awkwardly angle your foot underneath the shifter and possibly catch your toe on the ground, which could result in a crash or something else that is unpleasant. And one of the things that I love, especially about the attack rear sets, is that when you're running GP shift, you can still run the shift linkage through the frame like the OEM rear sets use. So the quick shifter still works as normal and it's super easy to just pull the rear set off of the frame, flip the linkage around if you did want to put it back to standard shift. I personally would never, but it's a great system and it works fantastically. So another modification that I've made to this bike in the ergonomic department is the aftermarket clip-ons that I have. These are actually just eBay clip-ons. They're just super basic 50 millimeter clip-ons, slip on the fork tube and then the bar is removable. So if you go down and crash, Generally speaking, you're just gonna snap a handlebar or bend the tube. So you can just slide the tube out, put a new one in, and you're good to go. I had firsthand experience with this earlier this year when I went down on that oil slick at my first CRA weekend doing the new racer orientation, but really easy fix. I was able to make it in maybe 20 minutes once I got home and had the bar tube. And now I carry spare bar tubes with me just in case. And the clip-ons are also nice because again, they allow you to adjust your ergonomics. These are at a slightly different angle than the OEM bars. And being that they don't lock into the triple clamps, you can adjust the height of them and also the angle. So this has, just like the rear sets, enabled me to feel more comfortable on the motorcycle and set the bike up for someone of my size to be in a good control riding position. So this is another component like the rear sets that has enabled me to set the bike up for myself and really cater it to the size of the person that I am, my riding style, and how I like to sit on the motorcycle. So I've also got Renthal Soft Compound Superbike Grips. I just like the feeling that these give. They're pretty sticky as well. Now, something else that you might see up top here and notice is my zero gravity windscreen. This is the Zero Gravity Corsa windscreen, and this is actually from a 2006 to 2008 Daytona 675. Backing up a little bit, this bodywork was originally on my 2006 Daytona 675 that I owned for about four years. So this is the Corsa windscreen from that. The bodywork between the 06 to 08 bikes and the 09 to 12 is 
pretty close. So this doesn't fit absolutely perfectly, but it fits well enough and is totally stable and secured to the motorcycle. The only caveat is that you need to use an 06 to 08 windscreen with the bodywork, which lucky for me, I had. So this raises the height of the screen about two inches over stock. I'm six foot three and I'm a big guy, so it's really helpful and helps me to be able to get out of the wind. Very aerodynamic and helpful in that regard. Now something else up here that you might notice is my AIM Solo 2 lap timer. So this is a GPS enabled lap timer. You just take it to the racetrack, turn it on, it detects where you are. I believe it has over 2000 different racetracks and configurations preloaded. So it'll automatically detect where you're at and start going as soon as you get on the track. And then I do have an aftermarket clutch lever. This is just an eBay lever. I only use the clutch to launch the bike and to come to a stop and put the bike in neutral. I don't downshift with the clutch. So it really isn't something that I use that much, but it's adjustable. It's a replica or knockoff, depending on how you want to describe it, of the Pazo levers. I actually had the Pazo legit levers on my old Toronto V4RR. These are pretty close. This is definitely the best one of these that I've had before. I've used the eBay levers quite a few times on Daytona 675s and such. I'm trying to get away from that with the Tuono V4, but again, for something that I don't use very often, it works great, uh, feels pretty solid. And then this actually runs back to my Yo-Yo Dine slipper clutch that I installed along with a Barnett clutch pack. So tested that out about a week and a half ago at Button Willow Raceway, went great. The slipper clutch works fantastically. The clutch holds strong. So everything's feeling good in that regard. And I'm excited to again, go out and see if these are gonna help me improve my times as I go racing. And then the final modification I've made up in the handlebar triple clamp area is my Woodcraft ignition bypass. So being that this is a race bike, it's kind of inconvenient to have to carry a key around with you. And it is in the locks garage unless I'm riding it. So I figured it would be best to just take that out and never have to worry about forgetting my key again. Nice and easy. And then the kill switch is just power and kill switch. And then rolling back into my theme of convenience and keylessness, I also have the Driven Racing Halo keyless gas cap. So pretty straightforward system, just compresses. There's a spring that locks it in and a locking mechanism. Pretty nice. You again, don't have to fumble around for your key, just makes for a much easier experience when you're out at the track. Circling back to bike control, you probably noticed my tech spec snakeskin tank grips, on both sides of the tank, as well as the center here. These just help you to hook onto the tank when you're leaned over in the corner, you hook your outside leg on the tank. These help you feel more stable, in control of the bike, they're grippy. It just really makes you feel more comfortable and confident on the motorcycle. A little bit closer here, as you can see back here, we have my APE cam chain tensioner. That is a manually adjustable one. The automatic hydraulic tensioners tend to fail on these bikes as mine was beginning to when I purchased the bike. If you let the bike sit for more than a day or so, the oil would kind of drain out of it. And when you went to cold start, you could hear the chain just kind of ticking, slapping around against the guides. So easy fix, a great part, highly recommend. Pretty easy to install overall, just need to remove the timing cover and stick a socket in there to keep tension on the chain while you're removing the fan tensioner and putting this on. And then setting the slack, there are instructions to do that, it's pretty easy. But overall, great mod in my opinion. Circling back to the front of the bike here, we are running just the stock setup on pretty much everything. This is the stock Olin's Nick Sport that came with the Daytona 675R, as opposed to the Kayaba or KYB suspension that came on the standard Daytona 675. It's fully adjustable, fantastic stuff right out of the box, way more than most people need, including myself. The only modification that I have made to the suspension, other than having it dialed in by Dave Moss, thank you Dave, is respringing the front with uh, stiffer springs. The OEM springs were a little soft for me. Again, I'm a big guy, six foot three, about 215 pounds. These are the OEM wheels, front and rear as well. Now, my braking setup is basically stock, aside from two things that I have changed. The first being my brake pads. I am currently running the Ferrodo X-Race brake pads. So they're a different compound that is designed to provide more stopping power. They do require a little bit of heat and do wear your rotors a little bit faster and wear out a little bit faster. But being that this is a race bike, that extra stopping power is definitely worth the trade off on track in my book. Outside of the Ferrodo X-Race pads, the only other modification that I've made to the braking system 
is the brake fluid. I'm running Motul's RBF 660 high temp racing brake fluid. That brake fluid takes more heat to get hot, so you don't get as much fade over the course of a race or a session out of the track. And it gives you good feedback through the butter as well. So it helps to reduce fade, helps to provide better feedback. Good call in my book. The rest of the braking system is original. These are the OEM Brembo M4 monoblock calipers. So really solid calipers right out of the box on the Daytona 675R. Running back up to the master cylinder, which is also a Brembo unit, although not one of their more premium units. I definitely say that's probably the weak point of the braking system if there is one, but running up to that master cylinder are stainless steel braided lines. Overall, it's a really, really, really solid setup right out of the box, and in a lot of cases, much more than your average person is gonna be able to use. The Brembo master cylinder that's on the bike, I'm not exactly sure what the model number is, but it's a pretty standard Brembo unit. I have read some things on Triumph forums about people having worse experiences than I've had with mine. I still do get a little bit of fade over time with the brakes, and I think that is just due to the master cylinder. It may just be time to rebuild it or replace it entirely. I have been looking into a 19 RCS, so that is something that is on my wish list and hopefully coming soon. But in the meantime, it works well enough and I can compensate my riding style for the little bit of fade that I do get over the course of, you know, five, six, seven, eight laps. And actually circling back to this, you might notice that the brake lever is black. The standard brake lever on this bike is silver. This is just an OE replacement lever. I got it on eBay. It is similar quality to OEM, weighs about the same, feels about the same rigidity wise. It's simply black with a red adjuster. It was actually recommended for a Ducati 848 Evo, but I've come to learn that Brembo uses the same OEM lever on most of their bikes. So in a lot of cases, a lever for any Brembo master cylinder will fit another Brembo master cylinder, as long as it isn't one of their aftermarket true racing master cylinders like the 19 RCSs. I just wanted to do that to give it that little extra bit of flair and personality. And then rounding out the brake setup, I am on the OEM Sunstar Rotors. These are actually a set that I purchased to replace on my old Daytona 675 on eBay used, about 120 bucks for the set. And there's plenty of metal left, so they're still well within the service limit, but rotors feel great. The only thing that I've seen some people do, and actually my spare wheels have this done to the rotors, but where the rivets have been drilled out a bit so that the rotors float a little bit more. I've heard that this helps a little bit with just the brake pad's ability to slip on the rotor and overall performance of the brakes, but I've yet to do that modification to these rotors and not really sure if I will. So coming around to the rear of the bike here, again, you can see the race tail fairing, no tail light, no slot for a tail light. Again, purely race kit. On the rear side of the bike, really haven't done much again. This is the OEM Olin's TTX shock. It's a really solid unit. I haven't changed the spring rate or anything on it, but again, this was also set up by Dave Moss. So the bike feels fantastic, tons of grip getting on the throttle on corner exit, and the bike just feels great really all the way through a corner on the track. Whether you're trail braking in, just opening the throttle up mid corner to start driving out, and on corner exit, standing the bike up under full power. The gearing is stock, although I did replace the chain and sprockets on this bike. They were pretty worn when I first got the bike. But this is just the OEM gearing. If I remember correctly, it is 16 teeth in the front, 47 in the rear. And this is a 525 pitch DID gold chain. So it doesn't really add any performance. Getting another rear sprocket to quickly change gearing for certain tracks is something that has occurred to me and something I might explore in 2022, but we'll see. Outside of the Olin's TTX shock back here, again in the bodywork, we've got the GB Racing case saver for the stator cover that has been tested and held up great. So it's still on there from that uh, low side of Button Willow when I hit the oil slick back in June. Attack rear set here, and of course the quick shifter. This is just the OEM Triumph quick shifter. Works very well actually. Super seamless, at high RPM, wide open throttle. It's a fantastic piece. Again, back here we've got the OEM wheel as well as the Dunlop Entec soft compound slick 180 60 17. And then the last component up here is my Triumph off road slip on exhaust. So this is actually a Triumph part. It came on my original 2006 Daytona 675 that I had before this bike. And because they're both the generation of Daytona with the undertail exhaust was a direct fit. Took it off of that bike, put it on this one. And I love it. It sounds great. It's not very loud. This still has the full OEM header. So it has the cab, it has the XF valve. It's pretty subdued at low RPM. This definitely makes it a little bit throatier at idle and low RPM than the stock exhaust did but 
gives you a little bit more flow also when that XF valve is wide open when you're pinned. Especially if the track sounds really good. I haven't really been going for power with this bike, as you can probably tell. I still have a stock ECU flash, haven't changed anything behind the cat and XF valve. So really looking for more of a bike that I can improve my own skills on and that'll support me in that and give me the tools that I need to work through any deficiencies in my own skill. But overall, I've been super happy with the bike so far. It handles fantastically and is just an absolute blast to ride. So now that we've covered all of the hardware that's on and in the bike, let's talk a little bit about the fluids for a moment because there are certain requirements as to what you can run in a race bike, mainly with the cooling system. So I use Redline Supercool, which is 50-50 pre-mix of distilled water and water wetter. So it provides better cooling properties, also provides some corrosion protection, but also won't result in a slippery mess if it does end up on the track. It'll evaporate naturally like water does and not really leave much residue. Antifreeze is banned in most club racing series, specifically for that reason. If a bike goes down on track and you get antifreeze on the track, it is a pain to clean up similar to oil and can result in some undesirable circumstances. But outside of the coolant, I also use Motul's 300V racing motor oil. It's an ester core and provides better protection under extreme circumstances and load compared to your typical synthetic oils that are recommended for street bikes. So just doing everything that I can to get as much protection as I can on this engine. I change the oil typically after every race weekend or about 300 miles on track. So doing everything that I can again to just extend the lifespan of this engine. So the last two items I have to complete to go racing with this bike, aside from throwing on the race body work, getting some tires and some brakes that would deal a little bit better with those conditions, is first removing the kickstand. So this bike has no kickstand. That is a requirement per basically all club racing organization rules. And in addition to that, I had to safety wire a lot of bolts on this bike. So I had to drill holes in each of the pinch bolts for the fork tubes, the drain plug for the oil sump. I had to drill a hole in the bolt that secures my heat exchanger to the engine, the pinch bolts for the front axle, the brake caliper mounting bolts, the rear axle bolt, the rear brake caliper mounting bolts, and then run safety wire through all of that stuff. So. There's safety wire all over my bike. Again, this is a requirement. It's a preventative measure so that if by some crazy chance you're properly torqued bolts, because we all should properly torque our bolts, but in case your bolts start to back out from some weird vibration or just over time, it can happen just on its own, especially with buzzier engines like the Triumph three cylinder, the safety wire will catch the bolts so that it doesn't back out all the way or back out enough so that something could fall off of your bike or something could go catastrophically wrong. So this is something that I check before each race weekend along with my brakes, oil level, just the bike generally for leaks and making sure that everything is moving freely like the wheels. And then one last thing to throw in here, just because I think I might get this question about how my Solo 2 is mounted to my bike. I bought a mount that clamps onto the fork tube from 419 Racing out of Ohio. So it was expensive. I'd say the value's there for sure. It's a really solid product and does a great job of keeping the lap timer in place and secure. Beyond that, you may also be wondering why I have this black electrical tape X on the front of my fairing, and that is because I am going racing with a club that, again, is not my club that I am a member of. I'm a member of the California Road Race Association, or CRA. CVMA is a club that I haven't joined yet, but may in the future. But for the meantime, because they have another rider out there that is registered with the 177 number and I'm running reciprocity, they note that by having me attach an X as a suffix to my race number. So 177X for the weekend going to CBMA and looking forward to it and seeing what times I can put down. But before we wrap up here, how about a cold start? Daytona 675R race bike and all of the little bits and details about it. 
So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, be sure to give it a gentle little click of the like button. Consider subscribing to see the races, which I'll be posting next week, and just a recap of how the entire weekend went. Wish me luck while I'm out there racing. Drop a comment below and let me know if you have a track bike, if you've ever thought about club racing or even going to the racetrack at all. I love talking about it, so let's have a conversation down there. Turn the notifications on if you do subscribe, find out when I post those videos, check out the rest of my content. I'm an avid track day enthusiast and club racer, so I have quite a few videos of the racetrack, but check those out. Let me know if you enjoyed this. Let me know if you're thinking about building your own track bike, and I'll hope to catch you in the next one. Until then, later.